Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so I was actually, I was realizing that I kind of, I put NSF in the title and then I was wondering, actually as I was sitting here, probably the people in this room generally know what NSF is, but I wasn't actually completely sure if everybody else at the conference did. Um, so maybe I should have spelled out National Science Foundation. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that uh, I said OCI here, and that's what's in the book and in the title. Um, and OCI is the Office of Cyber Infrastructure, uh, but we've recently been renamed uh, and, and uh, acquired in some sense. Uh, and we're now the Division of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure within the Computer Science uh, Directorate. So, um, so with that, I'll get going. I guess uh, because this is the, the very end of the, of the conference, with the exception of some, uh, something that's going to happen after the break, some closing, um, I'd like to try to make this informal, if we can. Um, so I'm actually going to stand here behind the microphone, which is bad, but I guess that's what the camera wants. Um, but if you guys have questions, um, if there's something that I seem to be skipping over, then just interrupt me and, and tell me and we can stop and talk about something else at the time. Um, I, was, I think at one point I was thinking this was a 45-minute talk rather than an hour, so I'm not quite sure how far I'll go, but we'll see. Okay, so, um, right, so software as infrastructure, what, what does that mean? Um, so just to, to give some examples of some science that's going on that NSF has been involved in the funding. Uh, we had this discovery announced at CERN in July of last year of the Higgs boson, uh, which was quite exciting. Uh, and actually, sorry, my, uh, my uh, physics friends say that I'm supposed to say that this is a, a particle not inconsistent with the expectations for the Higgs boson. Um, so, so something was found, and, and this is probably what it is, but nobody's exactly sure. Um, and it's, you know, it was found using this LHC, Large Hadron Collider Instrument, uh, which is a, uh, about a billion euro instrument um, that's been running for uh, a couple of years in production now. Um, but in addition to that billion euros that, that built this thing that actually does these collisions, uh, there's also this big set of infrastructure of, of computing hardware of the worldwide LHC computing grid, uh, which is about 235,000 cores across 36 countries. Uh, it includes Open Science Grid in the US, uh, EGI in Europe, and other things in other places. Um, it's producing lots of data, uh, about uh, 20 petabytes of data in the last couple of years. Um, there's all sorts of software involved, grid middleware, physics analysis applications. Um, there's networks that bring all these things together. Um, there's education and training about getting people able to use this and, and write the software and everything like that. Um, and uh, in my understanding is that that's about 80 million euros a year in terms of the computing hardware. And, and actually there's kind of a weird story about why the computing is distributed that's related to budgets and, and not wanting to have the full cost uh, announced at the beginning. Um, but nonetheless, everything's distributed and everything has been working. Um, so, uh, so this is a single instrument that's generating data centrally, then it has to move it across this multi-tiered infrastructure in order to do the computing. All right, so there's lots of different pieces of infrastructure that are really supporting these science discoveries. Uh, another example, uh, I was uh, at uh, LSU. Uh, we had this big hurricane called Katrina uh, that went across New Orleans. And this is just showing the, the tracks, the forecast tracks over time. Um, and as you can see, when we're a few days out, this is every dot is every six hours. Um, it takes pretty long time before the, the track started to converge to New Orleans. Um, and in, in order to do this analysis and to try to figure out really what was happening in advance, right, there's, there's these big multi-physics applications that are going on that involve atmosphere, or ocean, uh, coastal models, vegetation models, soil models, um, that have different sensors, satellite sensors, uh, satellites and other data systems, as well as local data systems as inputs. Um, and then there's all these kind of human issues as well. So, um, so if you're trying to figure out what's going to happen as this storm goes overhead, you can figure out through, through these models, here's kind of the waves and here's how the storm surge is going to go ashore. But then you want to actually see, okay, so where are the roads and how are the roads going to be affected? Uh, where are the people? When you say that you're going to evacuate, uh, where, are the number, where are people at that point? Where are they going to go? Are they going to evacuate? Are they going to go home and pick up their dog? Um, right. All right, so there's behavioral models. There's a lot of different actual models that go into all this. Um, and so the infrastructure here is really uh, the ability to do urgent and scheduled processing. Um, so when the hurricane pops up the first time, um, it's, it's usually something that wasn't exactly planned. There, there were, the scientists knew that there was a possibility, um, but you want to immediately start doing some, some f uh, forecasting. And then over time, you kind of get into a, a state where every six hours or so, there's new wind forecasts coming and you start doing right, new processing. And you know that you're going to be able to do those. So you can make reservations for time. 
Um, there's workflows because these are ensembles, so there's lots of things that need to happen and they're linked, so there's basically chains of workflows or larger workflows. Um, there's the applications, there's again the networks bringing the data together, uh, decision support systems, visualization systems, data storage, interoperability. All right, so there's, again, there's a lot of infrastructure here and some of it's software, but a lot of it isn't. Okay, um, if we look at the other end of things, what we tend to call long tail science as opposed to big science, um, there's, uh, there's right, exploding data volumes today and, and new simulation methods, meaning that there's more and more researchers that are really working in, in science areas. Uh, with access to data and access to computing. Um, and this graph is looking at uh, award size versus number of awards for NSF grants. And what you can see is that there's some very large awards, but there's a very, very long tail of smaller awards. And all of these people, well, not all of them, but a large number of them are doing some kind of computational work. Right? And in generally, they can't afford to have expensive expertise and unique infrastructure like the, like the big projects can. Right? They need to be able to use things that already exist um, and to use things that are available for multiple research, researchers. So the challenge here is to either outsource or to automate um, time-consuming common processes. And so just as an example, uh, one of those things that has to happen is, is data transfer, moving data from one place to another, where it's generated to where it's processed, where it's processed to where it's stored, something like that. Um, so there are tools like Globus Online, as an example, that are able to do this, and this is kind of just a chart showing uh, the duration of, of runs that are happening over some uh, couple of year period through, uh, through Globus Online. And it's showing basically that we've got uh, uh, some things that are one second, one minute, one hour, one day, one week. Uh, the green dots are uh, over a terabyte, uh, the red dots are over 10 terabytes of data being transferred. Um, so there's substantial amounts of data being moved by services like this. Um, there's also science gateways, as we heard about yesterday. Uh, things like uh, NanoHub and Cypress that I'll talk about in a minute, and other ways of providing access to common scientific software. So, uh, so Cypress, just as an example of this, uh, Cypress is a science gateway for phylogenetics, um, studying the diversification of life and the relationships of living things over time. Uh, it's, it's a highly used tool with citations in, uh, this is actually probably six months ago, so this is, these numbers are probably a bit old. Uh, at that point, about 400 publications, including kind of pretty large journals. Uh, 5,000 users at that point in three years, I think it's closer to 10,000 now. Uh, used routinely in 68 undergraduate classes at that time. 45% uh, of the usage being U.S., 55% being international. Um, and, and so there's an infrastructure here that's a flexible web application or a science gateway that can be built um, on common tools that can be used for other science gateways. Um, there's software and lessons from the Exceed Gateways team, uh, identity management, HPC job control. Um, there's actually the science software that does the science itself. Uh, and so in that case, it's parallel versions of codes that were commonly used but may, may not have been parallel, uh, available as parallel codes before. Um, and then a lot of stuff about data, so areas for users to store the data that they're working with, uh, tools to transfer and view the data. Okay, so with those as examples, um, what I've tried to say is that there's, there's a lot of infrastructure that's needed for a lot of science. And, and the challenges in infrastructure actually kind of fall in a bunch of different areas. So in terms of, of science, uh, what we see today is, is larger teams, more disciplines being represented in, in teams as well as across teams, uh, and more countries being involved in such projects. Uh, in terms of data, we have uh, increases in the size and the complexity and the rate, or all the Vs if you want to say it that way. Um, we have the need for interoperability in terms of data, which can be systems that have to interoperate or it can be policies that have to interoperate. Um, in terms of the systems themselves, the computing systems, we're having increasing numbers of cores, uh, increasing diversity of architectures, um, more levels of memory hierarchy. Um, balances are changing, right? So latencies are uh, changing very slowly. Bandwidths are changing more quickly. Um, so the balance between them is changing over time. Uh, the, the limit on computing systems used to be how much funds you had available to build what you wanted. Uh, soon it's going to be how much power you can afford in order to run what you can build. Uh, system architectures and business models are changing, so, uh, so the role of clouds and virtualization coming into this, I think, is, is a question. Um, it's, well, uh, the extent uh, to which clouds are going to be the answer maybe is the question. Uh, they certainly will have some role. Uh, network capability and capacity are growing, but the increase in things being networked means that we need to have increased security. 
Uh, in terms of software, right, the, as I was saying before, uh, algorithms are including more and more physics. Um, there's more and more frameworks that are being built to, to actually do these things. Uh, we're having new programming models and abstractions. Well, either we have or we need new programming models and abstractions for science and data and hardware. Uh, issues of verification and validation, uh, reproducibility and fault tolerance, uh, again, are, are things that uh, people traditionally haven't necessarily thought about in production software, but are beginning to, to realize are necessary. Uh, and then finally, in terms of people, uh, we don't do as good a job as we need to in terms of education and training. Uh, we don't provide career paths for people in software, uh, particularly at universities that we probably should. Um, and, uh, and there's large issues about credit and attribution. And I'm going to talk about some of these as we go through. So, um, so as, uh, uh, as Marlon uh, presented yesterday, you, this is this I top of this. Yeah, thank you. I, I, it was interesting. I was actually checking as you were doing it, and I noticed that the, 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 the borders on the words were exactly the same, and I was wondering how you did that. Okay, very good. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so Craig Stewart at Indiana has this definition of cyber infrastructure that I really like, saying that cyber infrastructure is computing systems, data storage systems, advanced instruments, and data repositories, visualization environments, and people all linked together by software and high-performance networks to improve research productivity and enable breakthroughs not otherwise possible. And so if you think about this as a definition of cyber infrastructure, then the elements of the infrastructure can be brought out. And the elements then are they're, they're parts of an infrastructure. They're developed by individuals and groups, um, often internationally. Um, they're developed for a purpose, and they're used by a community. And so when we have proposals that come into NSF that want to, uh, want to build some element of infrastructure, one of the things we look at is, is what are the answers to all these questions? Right? How does this thing fit with other things? Um, who's building it? What are the partnerships? What's the purpose? Who are the users going to be? Right, so, so in some sense, this definition actually leads to, to all the interesting questions that you might want to ask. So, um, so software is infrastructure. That's really uh, one of the, the arguments that I want to make. It's, it's one of the different types of infrastructure. Um, if we look at, uh, at the role of software, it fits in between the science that gets done and the computing infrastructure that's underneath. Um, it's the thing that really glues them together. Uh, if we look at scientific discovery and technological innovation, you can think of software as in between those things. The technology uh, drives the software that drives science, or the science requirements uh, get transferred into software and then lead to advances in technology. Um, there's a relationship between software and education that's interesting in that software can be used to, to help with education, um, but we also need education in order to create the people that are going to be able to build software or to be able to use it. So, um, so the argument that I want to make is that software is essential for the bulk of science that's being done today. Uh, when I looked at some recent issues of science, uh, about half of the papers talked about projects that were really software intensive. Um, the research that's going on is becoming increasingly dependent on advances in the underlying software. And there's significant software being developed uh, across NSF in a variety of areas. So, uh, so NEON, uh, I think, was mentioned by somebody here. Uh, OOI is an ocean project, uh, NICE is a, um, uh, an earthquake project, uh, NCN is, is a nanotechnology project, iPlant uh, is looking at plant genetics and, uh, and plant uh, behavior in some sense. Um, so there's, there's things going on in software across NSF that all have some common needs. Um, there's a wide range of different types of software from, from systems to applications to, to modeling to gateways, analysis, algorithms, middleware, libraries. Uh, development and production of and maintenance of software are people intensive. Um, so, so in some ways you can say that the, the cost of software is increasing because the cost of people is increasing or the cost of hardware is going down. Um, software lifetimes are long compared to the hardware. There was a discussion, uh, I don't remember, in the, I guess in the business panel yesterday, uh, about 50 year lifetimes for projects. Um, I, I don't know about 50 year lifetimes for software, but we certainly have software that's, that are now that's 20 or 30 years old. Um, and, and depending on who you talk to, some people would call those, uh, some of those applications uh, legacy applications, and I, I kind of prefer heritage uh, as, a, as a more positive term. Um, but, there's, but there's definitely work that's been going on for a long time with large numbers of people, and we don't really want to lose the, the results of that work, which are often captured in software. Um, and then finally, software, I think, has an underappreciated value. Um, we've gotten to the point where we're computing hardware that you can buy, people kind of understand what it's worth. Um, data, people are starting to understand, has, has more value than they thought before, and, and, right, and there's lessons about what we need to keep and what we don't. 
Um, software, I don't think, is quite there yet, but it's, it's moving in the right direction. So, um, so at NSF, uh, in terms of, of looking at infrastructure, um, there was a, a set of documents and a, an activity that started, um, I don't know, maybe five years ago or so, uh, called Cyber Infrastructure Framework for 21st Century Science and Engineering, or CIF 21. And this really was, really was looking at a, a cross-NSF portfolio of activities to provide integrated cyber resources to enable new research opportunities in all science and engineering fields by leveraging ongoing investments and using common approaches and components. Um, so what NSF did after kind of defining this is it set up six task forces uh, across the country with, uh, I don't know, between 30 and 40 people, maybe 50 people in each task force, um, looking at basically what needs to be done in these areas of campus bridging, meaning how to connect campuses together with national resources and how to connect campuses with each other, uh, cyber learning and workforce development, <coughs> data and visualization, uh, grand challenges, HPC, and software for science and engineering. Um, and, and each of these areas wrote, uh, wrote reports, and the reports are available at this URL. Um, from those, then, the, uh, the Office of Cyber Infrastructure um, started creating vision and strategy reports for each of these areas. Um, and we're in, kind of in the middle of this process. We haven't done all of it yet. Um, but, uh, but there's reports for computing infrastructure, for software, and for data. <coughs> and then uh, in software, I think we're kind of leading the way in terms of creating a document that we call implementation of the software vision, which is intended to tell people, uh, if you want to do software in some area, here's where you should be proposing it, and here's, here's kind of what we're, what we're looking for. So, uh, so the software vision, just to mention a few pieces, it says that NSF will, will take a leadership role in providing software as enabling infrastructure and promoting software as an important component. Uh, the idea of this is to advance the use and development of new software and to promote the ubiquitous integration of scientific software across all disciplines. All right, so I think this is, in some ways, this is kind of, I don't know, not, not tremendously exciting because it's kind of like mom and apple pie, it's just saying everything. Um, but, but then when you look at what actually needs to be done, then we get into some details that are more interesting. And so we, we think of, uh, of software and these other areas as really having five components. Um, so the, in some ways, the central component is to create and maintain a, a, a software, in this case, ecosystem, that provides the capabilities to advance and accelerate scientific inquiry. Um, you could take away software, you could put in hardware, and, and these slides would be valid for a different area. I'm just going to use software as the example. So in order to, to have this ecosystem, we need to have foundational research that's coming in in order to bring in new elements into the ecosystem. So we, we think of the ecosystem in some very, very loosely biologically inspired term um, as the set of, of activities that are going on and we need new things to come into the area. Um, and, and then once we have the ecosystem, we actually need to be able to use it to enable the, the science and engineering discovery. Um, we have lots of different issues about policy um, and so uh, so there's lots of questions that need to come in in terms of how to actually, how to make the ecosystem work and how to make sure that people can use it effectively. Um, and there's issues about uh, academic culture, open dissemination and use, reproducibility and trust, curation, sustainability, governance, citation, stewardship, uh, and attribution of authorship um, that all, I would say, have policy needs that haven't been addressed at this point. Um, and then finally, we have the education piece, as I mentioned before. So we need the ecosystem to help develop and, and, uh, and sustain the, the next generation workforce, um, but we also need the next generation workforce to be able to actually work in this area and to keep the ecosystem growing and to keep new components coming in. So, um, so what we're doing in uh, what was OCI that's now ACI, um, I'm just gonna kind of go through a couple of things fairly quickly. We have some kind of foundational research where we're looking for people to test out new algorithms and new ideas. Uh, we have something called computational and data-enabled science and engineering, where people that have these ideas that have been tested out want to see if they can actually be used to solve particular problems. Um, and, and once they can be used to solve a particular problem, um, then we want to turn them into infrastructure and give people funds to, uh, to sustain them, to maintain them, to, to keep addressing community requirements as they come up. Um, so this is kind of the, the variety of things we have. I'm just going to talk about this piece primarily as the infrastructure piece here. So, uh, so we have a program called SI2, and in that we have a bunch of different activities. We have uh, at the smallest level software elements, which are 
uh, projects that are up to three years, up to half a million dollars, usually one or two PIs, a couple of grad students, something like that, building some, some relatively small bits of software, uh, again, with a defined user community, with a defined purpose, um, but building it and supporting it and making sure that the community actually is happy with it. We have uh, software frameworks, which are not necessarily frameworks, but that's the word we use for something that's bigger than elements. Um, but it's something that's incorporating multiple elements or, or incorporating multiple pieces of technology in some sense. Uh, multiple PIs, maybe up to five PIs, up to five years. Uh, funding that is up to, I think, up to five million. Okay. Yeah, up to a million a year. Sorry, we just we only think of numbers as single numbers because we try to give out money and then and then not have to keep giving it out gradually year after year. Um, so uh, so yeah, so up to five million over five years. Um, and, and, and elements could be integrated into frameworks, potentially. Um, then kind of at the, at the top level, in some sense, we have institutes. And so the idea of institutes is that they're, they're providing some kind of central mechanism to make frameworks and elements more effective, to build communities, to keep communities working together. Um, these may not be communities that are associated with a particular software package. Um, they could be communities like people doing water system modeling. Um, that have a variety of different packages and we want to make those packages interoperate and work together uh, or something like that. Um, as we go up in, in size, we have, again, this kind of integration that's happening across. We also have hopefully larger and larger communities that are being affected by these projects. And then, um, and then finally, we have the idea of reuse. Um, so the elements are being reused kind of going across, but the elements hopefully also are being reused by projects outside, right? The frameworks are being used, reused by projects outside. Uh, the institutes are working with other with other people outside of NSF as well. Um, so this is kind of just a, a picture of what the the software the SI2 program is doing. Uh, let's see, I'm not sure what part of this I want to talk about. Um, we funded about 50 projects in the uh, the element and the framework size over the past two years. Uh, we have a focus solicitation with the chemistry division and with the UK EPSRC where we're funding collaborations in computational chemistry. Um, there's a solicitation that's currently open for more elements and frameworks with proposals due March 19th, I believe. Um, so, uh, so if anybody has a great idea and wants to work really fast, um, there's still an opportunity. Uh, in terms of the institutes, we've had uh, 13 conceptualization awards put out so far. Conceptualization awards are basically half a million for one year, and they're kind of like planning grants for people to, to work with their communities to try to understand exactly what the communities need, uh, to figure out who they're not, who they don't have in their team that they should have, um, to do other things like that. Uh, and we have a second solicitation that's closed now, but we'll probably be funding a few more of these um, in the near term. And we will hopefully have a solicitation for full institutes in late FY14, uh, which is about a year and a half from now. Um, we're working with, uh, with China as well. Uh, the National Science, sorry, National Science Foundation of China, or NSFC. Uh, we have a partnership with them um, where we have a small set of initial projects that we're funding, and this new solicitation here um, is open to international partnerships, and NSFC has a due date that's exactly the same as ours, and so we're looking for uh, partnerships there, uh, proposals there that are uh, a Chinese and the U.S. team doing something together. Um, we're happy with other countries as well. We just haven't done the coordination as well. Um, as I mentioned, we've kind of coordinated on an individual basis with the UK. Uh, we're talking with France about doing something maybe in mathematics. So, so we're looking for opportunities to work with other people because we recognize that, that software isn't developed just in one place. Um, but it's, I would say that it's very painful to do these international collaborations um, in terms of our management. It's equally painful for you to do them in terms of your actual work. So. Um, and then finally, I guess I just want to say there's a, a URL down here at the bottom that has a list of all the projects we funded. Um, so this is the roughly 50 of these, the roughly 15 of these. Um, I don't know, this is something that I'd be interested in talking to people maybe afterwards, is one of the questions we have is, right now this is kind of, it's a list of projects that says project name, PI name, some keywords, a URL where you can pick up the software, uh, a link to an abstract that talks about what the project's trying to do. Um, we don't really have a good sense of actually how this should be organized um, or how it should be searchable or how we should be connecting it with other open source projects or other software projects. Um, so ideas on things like that I'd be happy to, to talk with anybody about afterwards. Um, we're, we're kind of 
basically just starting with what we can, um, but we recognize that this probably isn't where we need to be in the long term. Okay, so, um, so for people that have proposed into this, um, there's at least a couple of people from universities here. Uh, it's worth, I think, talking about actually how we, how we run things internally. Um, and I hope this is interesting to people that actually aren't uh, going to be proposing as well. Um, but we have a, a cross NSF software working group that has members from all the directorates. So from biology, uh, physics, chemistry, uh, geology, engineering. Um, and, and that group decides basically how this program fits with, NS with other programs. And we wrote this, again, this document trying to tell people how all the software programs fit together. Um, we discuss solicitations and we determine which groups are going to participate in each, which means basically who's going to put money into each. Uh, and then we work together to, to do reviews and when we work together to fund proposals. And, um, and so let me talk about the funding proposals part for a minute because I think, again, this is something that's interesting that doesn't really get discussed very much. Um, I'm going to assume that a proposal, we have a proposal that's reviewed strongly um, because otherwise we don't really have to make much of a decision and it's pretty easy not to worry about. Um, but if we start with something that reviews well, then I have to start kind of doing matchmaking, which means I have to find program officers in areas that will be interested in this project that have money that will want to support this project. All right? And that's basically because I can't support everything. I need to work with other people around NSF. So if a biology project comes in, um, I will try to support some of it, but I will need the biology program officers also to want to support some of it. And if they aren't going to support it, then I'm going to wonder why not. And I'm going to wonder if it's something that I should be supporting by myself or not. So, so I want to find program officers that have funds and convince them that this is a good way to spend their funds. If we have a project that's uh, what I will call a unidisciplinary project, uh, a bioinformatics application as an example, <clears throat> then I'll probably try to work with a a, a single program officer who either will like the program the proposal or not. And if they like it, we'll try to fund it. If they don't, it'll probably be dead at that point. If we have a multidisciplinary project, right, that's going across different disciplines, um, then I'm going to work with multiple program officers. And in this case, actually, things are easier for me because if one of them isn't interested, I still have more and, and it's likely we can get some funds and we can go ahead with the project. Um, if we have an omnidisciplinary project, all right, so I'm just making up words here, so I hope this doesn't bother anybody. Uh, okay. Um, so just as an example, uh, a web server uh, or a library, um, I'm going to try to work with all the program officers. But what I'm going to be told is that it's not my problem. It's not a biology thing. It's your problem. You do infrastructure. You pay for it. Um, so, it's, so it ends up being kind of interesting at that point as well. Um, so in some sense, just as, as advice for people that are writing proposals, um, it's good to have some focus. Because if you don't have some focus, it makes it very hard for me to get funding from other areas. Um, in all cases, there's a need to forecast impact. Um, and in some cases, we can say that past performance can predict future results. Uh, right? Somebody proposes a project, and they say, I've been working on the software for three years. I've got this user community. Right, that helps me say, OK, I know that there is a user community. It's, maybe it's going to grow, maybe it's not. But at least I know that it's there. If it's a new project, it's very hard for the team to make an argument that says, we know that people need this, even though nobody's been using it yet. Right, so there's, there's kind of a question there. And this is important for us to try to figure out. And it's important for the community to try to figure out is, is how do you know when you've written software, who's using it and what they're doing with it? And before you've written it, how do you know that somebody's going to use it? And so I'm going to try to look at the, the f first part of that. Um, so, so just how do we measure impact? Or how do, how do you people that write software measure impact, at least in NSF? So just as an example, uh, we have somebody that's developing an open source physics simulation. So, so there's different things that they could count. Right? They could count how many people download it. And this is the thing that's easiest to measure and probably has the least value. Um, they could count how many contributors do they have. Uh, they could count how many uses of the software are there. Um, they could count how many papers cite the software, um, how many papers that cite the software are themselves cited. All right, so there's a kind of a variety of things that you can look at. And, and as we go down this, uh, we go from easiest to measure to hardest to measure, and we go from least value to most value. And so this is, I think there's a, a real challenge here uh, in terms of what's the, what are the right things to do and, and how do we do them? What's the infrastructure that actually enables this to happen? Uh, another example is the developer of an open source math library. So, um, so it's possible that the metrics that they're looking at are similar, 
but the citations are less likely, right? So if you're doing, uh, I don't know, if you're doing a, an earth science application, it's pretty unlikely that you're going to cite the math library that you used or the particular version of the particular developer. And so the further you get into infrastructure, the less likely you are to be cited is a problem. Um, and, and what if users don't actually download this? Um, so, so how do we measure it then? So maybe it's part of a distribution that we don't really have any sense of. Uh, it might be pre-installed in an HPC system. Um, it might be part of a cloud image. It might be a service that people are just connecting to. All right, so there's a lot of questions here about how we actually measure usage and how we measure impact. So, um, so what I want to give you is a, a, a vision for some things that we might do. Um, and you can tell me that this makes no sense. Um, you can tell me this is a great idea and you want to work on it. And I'll say, good, write a proposal and let's see if we can give you some money for it. Um, or something else. So, uh, so I'm going to start off by saying that we've got products. Um, and to me, products are, are software, papers, data sets, something like that. Um, and I'd like to have some way that they're registered when they're produced. Um, and in that one of the things that goes along with the registration is a credit map. So the person that registers the software, the paper, the data set, basically gives a weighted list of contributors uh, along with that registration. All right, so they say these are the people that worked on it. This person gets 20% of the credit. Um, this paper that I read gets 10% of the credit. The software that I use gets 30% of the credit. All right, so some, all right, some way of having a person decide this, because I don't think it can be done automatically. So the output of this is a DOI, some kind of a digital object identifier that's uh, a marker for that software, or that paper, or that product that's unique. Um, and the thing that's nice about this is this then can lead to transitive credit. Right, so, so transitive credit, for example, if we have paper one that says 25% of the credit goes to software A, and we have software A says that 10% of the credit goes to library X, right, we can now say library X gets 2.5% of the credit for paper one. Right? So we can actually start going down to things and say, how are these things being used? And it kind of gets around this problem where infrastructure doesn't get cited because the thing that gets built from the infrastructure can cite the infrastructure and, and we can keep building up. So, so this is something that I would really like to try to figure out some way of doing. Um, I don't actually know how to. Um, but it would help developers who right now would like to be able to say uh, in universities, my tools are widely used, give me tenure. Um, or NSF should fund my tool maintenance because there's lots of people that need it and there's lots of important science that's happening. And right now, as I said before, we don't have a good way of doing this. Of, of, right? you can't, it's very hard to make a case for either of these things now. And so the fact that you can't actually get credit for what you've done uh, leads to lots of issues in terms of, of career paths and, and uh, tenure and all sorts of things, uh, raises in industry. So, um, so there's some issues with this. Right? So this is, I don't know, I've been talking about this kind of on and off for a couple of years, but not really very seriously. Um, and so the issues that come up are there's social issues. Right? So the people that are involved have to trust the person that's doing the registration to actually give out credit fairly. Um, I mean, I think this actually works today. It works for papers today reasonably well. We have a culture that accepts citation and it seems to, seems to work okay. Um, it seems to work okay in open source where people seem to give credit to, to their developers and their committers. I don't see any reason this couldn't work. Um, there's a question about how to actually do this waiting uh, when you have complex projects. Um, if you can just wait until the end of the project and say, uh, yeah, I think this person did some part of the work and this person did some part of the work. If you need some kind of tools to help you accumulate some of this data along the way, um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, and, then, and then technologically, there's this kind of question about, about how do we actually register products and how would we register um, the, the credit app? Right, so what, is there a system? Are there multiple systems? Do they link together? Um, and this, this actually ties into provenance as well right, because every time that you do something, in theory, you want to know how you've done it and the tools that you used, but we don't have a way of doing that in a general way either right now. Um, if we could do that, we could do this or vice versa. So I don't know. So I, I think this is kind of an interesting question, um, but I don't know what the, what the answer is. And, yeah, and as I was saying, right, what's, what's the system? What are the interfaces? How do the systems work together? So kind of just going on. Dan, one little comment on that last one. Sure. Values. So instead of saying yeah, that was 60%, uh, 
you know, maybe you say it's, uh, I'd say 15 to 25 percent. So that way you'd have some, you'd have some error, you know, you'd have some range of, of values that sure. that a contribution. But, um, when you when you add all of them together, you also have some error bars. Could be. Yep. Certainly possible. So, um, so. Uh, so for again thinking about this technologically then then one question is is there a way of recording project product usage all right so you could say after you've finished right you finished doing some project um, I use this tool 25 times right? or or vice versa can you say that the project the, that I've used the tool that I built was used some number of times all right so so there's a question about where product usage could be recorded um, I think both the developer and the user really would like to be able to track usage of tools um, there's privacy issues about this. Uh, in some cases, I think some of this could be done in the U.S. today, but probably couldn't be done in Europe today, as an example. Um, I think there's there's competitive issues about this. Right? In some cases, people are happy to know who's using their tools. In other cases, uh, it may be something that right, that a tool developer doesn't actually want the knowledge of that to be sh widely shared. Um, right? We could build tools that have kind of a phone home mechanism that, when they're used, they actually talk to some server and, and make some registration, which leads to questions about how accurate that would be and if it could be hacked and other things. Um, but then there's also questions about what about usage in terms of products like data sets. Right? So it's not really clear what using a data set means um, and how that could trigger a usage record. With software, it's a bit easier. Uh, with a paper, you can imagine viewing the paper trigger something or something like that. So, uh, so I think there's a question about can general code be developed to do some of this? And if somebody could develop some general code, then would people incorporate it into their packages? Um, I don't know. This is a question. Uh, as I mentioned before, I think this is all tied to provenance, which, which is another open, I think, large open question today, in science at least. Um, again, then, yeah, so then with user input, we could tie later products to usage. Um, right. Just one of the issues is that, uh, is that when you're doing something in science, you may not know what your outcome is going to be ahead of time. Right? So there's some things where you're, right, you're trying something, you're experimenting, and, and after you're done, then you can go back and try to figure out what you've done. In other cases, it's, it's the other way around, um, right, which is what I'm saying. So, okay, so, so in my mind, actually, I, I can imagine this kind of grand future system where all this stuff is done. But, but I don't know actually how we would get there, right? because, because I don't know what the increments would be in order to, to move this at this point. So, so I think this is a question, and I don't know the answer. Um, I, I do want to say, though, that, uh, that the lack of credit for things, I think, is, is a much larger problem than, than people often think that it is. Um, the, the lack of credit, I think, is a, is a disincentive for sharing software and data today. Um, if there was a mechanism that would provide credit, it would remove this disincentive, as, as well as adding an incentive. And if anybody knows, uh, knows Lewin, um, this is kind of coming out of his force field analysis. Um, so it's. I, I don't know. It's one of those things where making a small change actually can can remove a disincentive and incre and add an incentive and make a large impact. Um, so uh, other things with this. So for commercial tools, we track credit by money, as was said in the in the talk this morning. Um, but this doesn't really help figure out what things were used for. Right? We could we could say what value people put on tools, but that doesn't actually help in the science case and the NSF case as well. Um, and uh, and it's not clear actually that paying for things encourages collaboration. Um, so, so again, these are just questions. Um, but, uh, but tied to this is a question about an economic model. Um, so right now, um, NSF gives out money for grants. Uh, we could imagine some kind of future world where we give out some kind of tokens for grants, and people that get those tokens then can give them to people that they're depending on, right? Give them to people that they're using their software, using their papers, um, right? So we could build some kind of economic-like model into NSF if we wanted to, if we chose to. We could do this for, for allocations of computer time as well. Right? So there's, there's lots of things that could be done. It's, it's not at all clear to me which of these actually should be done or which would make sense at this point. Okay, so, um, so let me move on slightly. Uh, so let's talk about some stuff actually. Uh, so when I was asked to, to do this in December, um, between Christmas and New Year's, I spent some time when almost nobody else was at NSF reading uh, Apache Foundation documents. Um, and found them to actually to be quite interesting and a bunch of stuff that I wouldn't have seen otherwise. So, um, so sustainability, I, I'm going to talk about a couple of things that I think maybe tie to Apache Foundation. So sustainability is one of them. Um, my definition of sustainability as a program officer is how are you going to pay for your software after I stop paying you? 
right? It's a slightly different question than I think than Apache would put it, but but this is my version. Um, and so and so I think there's questions then about what does support mean. So if you're going to support your software, what right? What does that mean? Um, so I, so I would say there's a question about can I build it and run it on my current system? So does the software adapt as the systems underlie as the underlying systems change? Um, do I understand what your software does? So are you continuing to provide documentation and training for it? Um, does it do what it's supposed to do correctly? All right, so are you tracking bugs and fixing them? Um, do you have some kind of verification and validation suite? Uh, does it do what I want? All right, so are you tracking my requirements as they come in or other user requirements as they come in and, and trying to update your software to meet new requirements? Um, and, and is your software changing? Um, is it something that's just fixed that's, that you just need to support, or is it something that really is developing over time? Um, so, so I think a question that, that I would ask is, is kind of what are the lessons from Apache that we should be bringing into NSF and into our software to help here? Um, and again, this is, these are, this is a question. This is not uh, an answer. So I'd be happy to, to talk about this afterwards, um, and my email address will be at the end, and I'd be happy to have ideas from people. Uh, also, let's, governance is another issue. So, so I think we, we care about governance because it tells users and contributors how the project makes decisions and how they can be involved in that process. So, um, so the issues here, to me, seem to be uh, who is the community in some sense? Is it the developers or the users or both? And it seems like there's different answers, at least for NSF software in different cases. Um, there's, there's what's the model of governance from the dictatorship to the meritocracy to anything else. Um, there's what's the development model itself, which seems to be tied to the, uh, to the governance model in some cases, but not necessarily always. Um, and, and again, how, right, how can Apache help NSF figure out right, what, the, what the issues are here and what some good answers might be? Um, right, one, one option is, uh, is that science projects in general, I think, are smaller than, uh, than most of the Apache projects. And so it would be interesting to know if there's differences between small Apache projects and large ones in terms of governance or in terms of sustainability and, and what happens, and if some of those smaller projects have lessons that could, could benefit some of the science projects that we have. Um, let's see, a few other questions. Um, so does the Apache way work for science? Um, I think is one that I don't know the answer to. Um, right? Is it, it could be that the underlying tools are useful for science and for their applications, and that's probably the base case that we'll assume is, is true now because we have good examples of that. Um, but does the general model really work for science, for, something, for things that are just science, not, not underlying tools? I don't know. Um, right, how many users or developers are needed for success? Right, so if we have a, a science project that has, has two developers, is it possible for that to be successful over time? And, right, and why or why not? Um, the incubator model is, I think, is very interesting, and, and I wonder if there's something like that that would work for science software in general, and if so, who would actually be running it, and, and who would be advising or mentoring? Um, or is there some version of that that would make more sense for software? It's not the, not the process as it is, but some version of the process. Um, there's another question that comes up actually a lot in science software today which is, uh, is, is what does open source mean? Um, and some people think of open source meaning that the source is available so that I can understand what's going on, and other people think of open source meaning that, um, that I can reuse and develop based on that. And, and I would say that the definition that, that we use in NSF is not completely clear, um, and the definition that we get in proposals is definitely not clear. Okay. Except for online, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so just to, to close, uh, up, last few questions. Um, so a bunch of general questions. I'm sorry, I'm asking lots of questions more than I'm giving answers, um, but hopefully this is of interest to people here. Uh, so, um, so software that's intended to be infrastructure has challenges that are different from other software. Um, so I, I would say unlike in business, having more users means more work. This is something that probably people here are common with, uh, are, are familiar with, right? That uh, the more users you get, the more support you have to give. Um, but you don't get any money to help. And in the case of NSF, we have this issue that right, the developers are actually expecting money to pay for their time. Um, so there's a little bit of a question there. Um, the last 20% of making something really useful, reusable, um, can take 80% of the effort. Uh, and particularly in science, there's often a, um, 
Uh, I would say uh, an understanding that you write the paper that proves that it works and then you're done. You don't actually make it usable necessarily by anybody else. All right, so how do we encourage people to, to take those next few steps? Uh, all right, so what, what can we do to make these things easier? Um, in terms of just the, the environment of what we're supporting, I think one of the questions we have is what fraction of funds should we be spending on things that exist and just supporting them and maintaining them versus new things? Um, I, I don't know what the right numbers are at this point. Right. How do we decide when to stop supporting something? Um, I think this is a, another question, right? We, it's, I think it's pretty easy for us to say that something new should come in. Um, all right, there's something new that has lots of users and we want to support it. Uh, but when do we, when does something old say not have enough users that it's not, we're not going to support it any longer? Um, how do we encourage reuse and discourage duplication? Um, I will say just as a, a kind of a small comment um, that as I've listened to the, the talks in the science track, um, all right, it seems like there's been at least kind of two different workflow-like uh, discussions that have happened. Uh, the, the, as I've heard from somebody at NSF, NSF has supported something like 143 different workflow technologies over different times. Um, all right, I don't know how many more we need. Uh, and I don't know how to make people stop using, stop building new ones, uh, or how to try to encourage people to stop building new ones. Okay, and finally, um, how do we more effectively support career paths for software developers, particularly in universities and labs? Uh, I think this is, this is really a big issue. So there's, there's a tremendous problem that people come in, um, well, actually there's another, there's one of the problems is that we're getting more and more postdocs, um, but if we ignore that as a problem, we get people that come in to, uh, to universities, um, I think this happens at JPL as well, uh, and, and labs, um, they come in, they're software developers, they do a good job for some period of time, and then they decide that, that really there's not a career path as a software developer for them at that place. Um, they're not a faculty member. Um, they're not going to become a, a principal investigator at JPL, whatever the equivalent is. And do they want to stay there or do they want to go somewhere else where there is a career path and there's going to be increasing rewards over time? Um, and often they go somewhere else and we lose them. And so the question is kind of how do we, how do we build something that, that makes them want to stay in, uh, in, let's say, academic in the largest sense environments? and non-commercial environments. Um, I think this is another question where maybe where Apache actually in, in the open source community kind of has an answer, but I'm not quite sure that I know what it is exactly. So, okay, so finally, um, if you want to do something, uh, we've got, again, a, a list of the SI2 software projects we have in the institutes. Um, take a look at it. If you want to be involved in one, I think people would be welcome. Uh, there's, there's always a need for more help in terms of software, in terms of, of development, in terms of documentation, in terms of training, in terms of all these issues. So, right, so now I sound like I'm Apache. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, and then finally, tell me what we should be doing differently at NSF. Um, I've kind of tried to tell you what we are doing and what questions we have. Um, so, so tell me here, send me an email, uh, whatever you'd like. So thank you for, uh, for the invitation to come, and thank you for listening. There may be a really brief answer to this, but I was just thinking the usual, or the, the classic NSF model is that um, tenure track faculty people are submitting proposals and NSF reviews them and they give the grants and so forth. And, and so it's really a uh, collaboration between NSF program officers and, and faculty to do academic research of a, you know, a three-year scale, which is about the lifespan of a of a grad student career, hopefully, you know, for, for finishing a, a PhD. Uh, has there been in, as uh, OCI has um, evolved and, and other parts of NSF have evolved, it seems like this, these are becoming more partnerships that should be occurring between the NSF and the campus CIO or CTO or whoever. And there should be more, instead of, um, instead of, uh, more of the uh, so many proposals that are software focused coming from coming out you know bubbling up from different random places within the university being more of a strategic coordination with the campus uh, 
the CIO who is responsible for working for running that infrastructure of that university or the that consortia university. Has there been any discussions or research or re reports or anything looking at uh, things from that point of view? Yeah, so I, I guess there's a, a few different comments that I can make. I, I, so I don't know of any anything in particular that's addressing what you're saying. I, I think I would say that there's there's an issue that there are an awful lot of different campus models, right? So in some cases, the CIO um, has some role in research. In many cases, the CIO has no role in research and doesn't want to. Um, so it's it's hard to imagine exactly a model that's going to fit everybody. Um, I, I think another part of the answer to this is that is that of all the things that we want to do, um, that we would like, let's see, let me say that again, of all the ways that we would like the world to be different at NSF, an awful lot of them are things that we can't do and universities have to do. Um, so, so the coordination inside a university is something that we don't have any way of, of asking for, even though we would like to have, I would say, more coordination in, in a number of universities. Um, <clears throat> another thing just to mention is that uh, NSF has a uh, grant and proposal guideline um, book that basically says that uh, if any person is going to be funded for more than two months during a year with NSF funds, they need to justify why that's needed, which makes it actually very hard um, to, well, it, there's actually kind of a two-sided piece to that. One is that it's, um, is that people that are not faculty members that don't have nine months of their salary being paid by the university um, have a hard time um, getting funded by NSF in some cases because of that. Um, and it depends on where you are. So in OCI, generally, we don't really care about that very much. Um, but in other parts of NSF, they do care about it a lot. And, and it's a balance because, because if we're going to fund 10 people that are doing software development um, 12 months out of the year, Right, then that's only 10 people that we're going to be able to support versus if we were going to support faculty members and graduate students, we could support some multiple of those number of people and we may get more done, we may get less done. It's not clear, but, right, but there's some kind of a balance there about, about the number of people we support versus how we support them. And, and in the case of universities, um, I think the universities have to choose how they're supporting their staff as well. And if they are supporting their staff, or if they're just depending on NSF and, and outside entities to support their staff, and so I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Right. So, I like the talk, and I think that you present a very sophisticated view of software as an entire ecosystem of matters regarding governance, education, sustainability, and so on. So. One aspect that you didn't talk very much about is that the, the complement to software that really remains is ideas. So, you know, Corba software may be obsolete, but there's certain ideas or concepts that we can still talk about, right? So, one thing that seems to me very valuable is uh, to understand what you think from all of these OCI projects over the years, what ideas or what concepts are helpful to disseminate, um, you know, less, lessons learned from the project, things that did not work for science infrastructure, things that worked very well for science infrastructure. And I think that would be very helpful. Um, there's several reasons. Um, I see a lot of scientists that need this one sliver of functionality and they're just going to build their own and they're going to build it wrong and they're going to build it in a way that's not interoperable when they need the second sliver of functionality. Uh, the other reason is that I see a lot of scientists developing software themselves. So they want to build their own, and I understand that. In some sense, we would want to convey to them what might be a faster way to get to where they need to go or deter them from trying to do that because they don't see the complexity. So it seems that maybe, you know, doing some good concerted effort to disseminate uh, you know, first of all, to extract or compile yeah. all these big <coughs> ideas, big lessons learned, and then really disseminate that to the practice of science infrastructure development. So that's my question. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's that's actually it's a very good question. Actually, it's an interesting question. So I, I guess as I think about this, um, 
Right. So, so some things that work are captured in software, and that's and in some ways that's the artifact that, that carries the lesson. Um, and sometimes that's fine. Uh, in some cases, there's something that works that doesn't get captured in software. It gets captured in a paper. Um, and that's probably OK to some extent as well. Um, when there's something that doesn't work, it probably never gets captured, right? Because, because we don't write papers about failures. Um, so, so I think there's definitely some issue about uh, there's, there certainly are some mistakes that are being made repeatedly because people don't know that they've been made before. Um, I guess the other thing that I was thinking about was numerical recipes. So, um, so I think at least for me as a graduate student, I remember I, right, the first time that I needed to do something, some kind of linear algebra, um, I, I looked at a, a textbook and I tried to figure out, okay, what's, what needs to happen here? What's the algorithm? Then can I write a code for this algorithm? And then at some point I found out, oh, there's this numerical recipes book and it actually tells me how to do it, and, and it actually has code as well. All right, and I can type in the code, and then, and then the code is available online, which is even better, All right, and I could just take the code. Um, and then I got to the point where I realized, you know, this is really, really bad code, actually. All right, it's, I mean, functionally, it does exactly what it should, but it's horrible performance, and it's not really written very clearly. Um, and so there's kind of this, I don't know, in some ways it seems like there's this process that, that you have to, well, that people do go through. Of, of, of right, realizing that they have a need and then trying to figure out like, what's the theoretical answer to this need, then is there some practical answer that I can just use? Um, and then, well, no, that's not exactly the answer I want. Is there some better answer that I can use that really does what I want? And, uh, yeah, so I, I, but I don't know what the, what the way to do that is. That's, yeah, it's, it's a good question and it's something certainly that we should think about how to do. Very nice talk. Like you should, have been, you should have pushed it very well because like lots of Apache audience would have benefited from lots of like the homework you did and what's relevant and all would have been nice to get some lots of insight because we see these kind of similar questions in the mailing list all the time debating like you know, I don't think so Apache has an answer but there are open questions and there are lots of thoughts being like goes around. So one thing I was wondering in the SSI program like you know is. Uh, the, when there's a SSCs and SSIs and, and the, so you mentioned about like the linkages uh, and also the, the workflow problem like you know, 150 how do, we, how do you stop mm -hmm. it I don't think so in the Apache 2 like you know, that's the, if there's a lot of reoccurrence but at least we've seen this there's some kind of a mention like when an incubator proposal comes in or oh, what other Apache projects do you use or uh, like you know, there are like you know, when you here and there like you know, basically people like there's no direct reward like you know, but people do that. And the other one we have heard recently is been strong with the, uh, the administrator just stepped out like you know, was administering the GSOP for Apaches, but was commenting that the most successful one were the cross pollinated projects like you know, done across multiple Apache projects. Even though they were slow to pick off, but they were yielded more instead of just a task and so on. So where in the I'm wondering, like, you now, where the proposals are, like, in this whole uh, SI Square program, like, you now, this reward or, like, you know, some, because you put out this nice token idea for, for that, like, you give out token, the similar way, uh, any thoughts or any plans to first classly bring out, oh, I'm probably using this, I'm modifying this. Yeah, I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's thing, right? Isn't that, uh, that was where his dream slides, I think, were part of the part, you know, I, I, mining that information. Well, so, I mean, so I think that there's, I don't know, it's interesting to think about this with, with Apache and what we're doing. So, right, so one of the things that I guess is interesting to me is that Apache is, I mean, Apache seems to be a fairly integrated community in some sense, um, right? The SI2 program is a set of PIs that all have been funded by NSF, um, but it's not clear that they're more integrated than, that they're any more integrated than that, right? So I think one, one question that I would say is, is how do we make the SI2 community um, more like the Apache community where they, right, where people know what's available and what other people have done and, and really try to work together more closely. Um, but then if I kind of keep going from that, I would say actually, well, okay, so why do we have a, an NSF community of developers and an Apache community of developers and a DOE community of developers and a European community of developers? Aren't these, aren't these people all kind of trying to do the same thing? So, so I think this gets back actually to this question about, about in general for open source software, well, let's say open source software, although actually strictly we're, we're not limited to open source software, we'll support things that aren't, but we'll say open source for the minute. Um, all right, so 
I don't, I don't know. Some some projects seem to get to this critical mass where everybody knows about them, and and they seem to get used either in a certain community or more widely. Um, I don't know how that happens, and I don't know how we can try to encourage that to happen. All right. So, and so I would say at least for if we go back to workflows for in the NSF world, there's there's probably five to ten workflow systems that are fairly widely used. Um, right? Maybe maybe five to ten is a good number. Uh, maybe it should be smaller. I don't know. Um, but but I'm not sure that it should be much larger. And and when somebody new comes in with a need, it's not clear to me how they find one of those five to ten things and how they decide this is the one that I'm going to use um, or I'm going to build something else. Right? So I think. I don't know. I think there's a lot of communication that doesn't happen, and I don't really know how to encourage it to happen. Uh, right between again between the developers that we fund and the Apache community and and the larger community. So. Yeah. I'm sorry. One last comment on that is in Apache too. I guess uh, the proposal comes to incubation, but also there are like frequent board reports going on and everything. And the emphasis is never on the quality of code or anything, and just like, are you engaging? Are you welcoming new committers and all? Whereas in the NSF proposal, I guess the only chance people try to justify is in the proposal. Once the reviewer funded, like, no, there is no, I think, like, no feedback or anything. Going no, back. that's true. Right, that's a good point. So in the yeah, in the the element and framework awards that we make, there once the award is made, it's basically made, and the team is going to get their money over the period unless unless something really bad happens. Um, for the institutes, we actually will probably make those as continuing awards, where where every year there will be a review, and you have to pass the review in order to get funded for the next year. Um, so that that actually will be a small change there. But but you're right. I guess the the issue is that. In some ways, the issue is that the Apache Foundation, in my understanding of it, is much more, I would say, is much more active than the NSF program management group in terms of, um, in terms of working with the projects that are going on. All right, so yeah, so we get proposals in, we have a peer review committee that looks at them and gives them some review, and then we decide if we're going to fund them or not. But that's, yeah, and that's kind of the end at that point. And even the peer review panel I think there are questions about kind of how much they really know about what's going on in other projects. Um, so we don't have the equivalent of somebody on the panel that's, um, say, a, an incubation mentor or something like that that really knows, well, here's the things that you should be working with and, and, and can say, well, please fix this part of your proposal, then we'll consider it again. That's, that's not an option. We either accept it or reject it. Um, and if it's rejected, then it waits a year. Um, so, it's, so, so the only comment that I had to add to that real quick is that um, so? So I think that that's precisely the way that it works at Apache, which is because it's it's a home for software communities. But the community is the more important part that they're actually tracking the metrics for, you know, and everything else. Which I think you guys want to do, you know, with with the SI2, you're trying to grow communities in some sense too around software. Yeah. Yeah. But um, you know, I would also address your point about. Um, <coughs> about Apache seeming at least to be, you know, really interconnected communities. Like Apache is very interconnected, but it's also very not interconnected as well. There are sets of Apache communities that work together or that know about each other or whatever, but that's not everybody. Like, you know, we started the Tika project or whatever and we constantly, you know, tell people about it or whatever that have never heard about it that we find all these places it could still be used in and then we do the same thing in other projects as well. The thing that connects us together, I think at Apache are like you know, at least through like these meetings or whatever, but also through the normative ways that we interact on the mailing list, the voting mm -hmm. and consensus process, the meritocracy, all the stuff that you had that you did a very good, diligent job of reading there over the good December break. So, so yeah, so, um, I mean, and you probably, I mean, it, it was by design through at least these couple days of tracks here in Apache and Science that a lot of this stuff was interconnected because it was by design to mm -hmm. find projects that were together that did that, but we could have just as easily, I mean, other tracks here for big data or whatever, you know, they may be a whole bunch of projects that have just heard about each other for the first time and are like, oh, wow, too. So I think, I think um, some of the principles, some of the stuff you talked about, like, tri like triage effectively, like when to shut a project down and whatever, or when to think about that, a lot of that stuff at Apache is driven by social, uh, social methodology, you know, or whatever, too, you know. Yeah, I, I, right. So, I, yeah, I think that's, I mean, in some ways, that's maybe one of the biggest differences is that Apache, 
Uh, Apache isn't giving out money to all the projects that are in Apache, right? And we are, and our projects are depending on us to do that in some sense. And, yeah. Sorry, one, 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 one last. Sorry. Yeah, so um, being the funding agents, are you in a position to actually dictate what kind of license all these software projects should have? Like, you know, there should be like a very liberal license so that everybody can use it? So, um, so are we in a position to do that? Yeah. Yes. Can you do it? Will you do it? Can I do it? Yes. Will I do it? No. Uh, you will not do it. No. <laughs> um, because I don't want to dictate that. Well, but I mean, being a government agency that, you know, I mean, I see one of your role is to, you know, I mean, spread the knowledge and you know, make these as easy as equal as possible. So you want to have the most liberal as you can, right? Uh, in some cases, yes. In other cases, no. Um, so in some cases, the, the best way to get something to be widely used um, is for people to deliver it into a commercial package that has a no-cost academic license. And that's, that's the way it's going to be most widely used. In other cases, it's the, to use the most liberal license possible and to make it as open as possible. It's, I don't think that there's a single answer. And so that's, that's one of the things that we ask, actually, in the, um, in the proposals. Uh, we ask people to say what license you're going to use, how are you going to be distributing your software, and why is this the best answer for your software? Um, and and, and in, in most of the time, it's 90, 95% plus it's open source, and it's usually a, a fairly open license, but not always. And it's and again, I don't think it's always the right answer. So. Yeah. Pretty much answer a question. So I guess a finer point would be if someone says it is open source software, can you then require them to pick any standard open source license? Um, we, we could do that. Uh, again, we, I guess we, in the process that we go through now, when we are actually making the awards, we ask them, which license are you going to use? And it's, it, it's I think it's always been a small number within like, I don't know, maybe five different licenses that I've seen. Um, and, and as far as I know, they've all been officially open source standard licenses, but. Thank you. So I, just as we're doing this, I will say that there's, I think the answer that I gave on that is actually as a common answer for a lot of these things is that I, in general, for the, the projects we get in, I don't want to mandate what people have to do. I want to, to let people find examples and find the right thing to do and then hopefully educate the reviewer community so that they make the best decisions and based recommendations. But go ahead. Hopefully this is too much of an insight question, but um, you know the EarthCube site is another NSF program. Um, went to some trouble to set up a Ning site to and forums and things like that to try and and be more visible about who the community was and what software was available, what problems people were, people were interested in, things like that. Do you see any value in doing anything like that for the S two I two? Or sorry, the SI squared program, which is supposed to be a community with a bit different focus. Um, so potentially, I would see value in doing that. Um, I guess there's a. So what we've done at this point is this this uh, uh, bit.ly link that I had up, which is a Google site. Um, so there's, I think there's value in doing that. The question is, what's the cost of doing that? Um, and is the cost worth the value? And I don't know the answer to that, right? So EarthCube has, um, has a, a contractor that's built that site and maintains it, and there's investment that they have to make in order to keep that going, and, and it's, not, it's not clear to me if that's worthwhile or not for the, for the SI2 program, so. Okay, all right, well, thanks, Dan. Thanks.